Trouble Brewing for Home Brewers, The Literary Digest, November 27th, 1920. America's youngest industry, as the Syracuse Journal facetiously characterizes the home brewing of malt liquors, is temporarily in a bad way. Hops and malt, according to a ruling of Federal Prohibition Commissioner Kramer, being component parts of homemade beer, may be sold only to bakers and confectioners. Setting hens, however, naming the ingredients that will give the best results, and bearing on their covers printed instructions regarding the manner in which the beer is to be made, still are for sale in New York stores. And some of the combinations have brought fortunes to their investors, notes the New York Times. This despite the fact that Commissioner Kramer declares that, The man who makes home brew in his northern home is just as much a lawbreaker as the moonshiner in the mountain fastnesses of the south. Why pick on the homebrew artists, one paper asks, after intimating that these inoffensive folks go quietly about their business? Another paper echoes, why, and further declares that they are sufficiently punished by imbibing their own concoctions. In searching for a reply, we find in the Utica Press an intimation that the manufacturers of soft drinks found that their business was being interfered with by industrious and thrifty people who make their own homebrew. The New York Herald, which describes Commissioner Kramer's U case as the hardest blow that Prohibition ever has received, tells us in its news columns that the near beer industry was losing out, while the demand for malt for homebrew was leaping upward. Dozens of breweries in Chicago, New York, St. Louis, and Milwaukee, adds the Herald, have been making malt syrup for homebrewing purposes. Now, since the new dry ruling, the purveyors of ingredients to homebrew folks to the number of 100,000 will be thrown out of work. We read on. Chicago reports that 300,000 of its families were making their own beer. Down in the Custom House here in New York, no figures on the number of homebrewers were available, because they will not admit that anybody is making it. Dealers in New York, however, say that at least 500,000 families are brewing 8% beer here. At that rate, the reader can make his own computation on the nation. That prohibition enforcement officers the country over, in undertaking to enforce the new ruling, will have a real job on their hands, in the words of the New York Evening Post, is the consensus of editorial opinion. Homebrewing and home distilling simply cannot be prevented as long as people want to indulge in the occupations, maintains the New York Globe. For, it adds, to outlaw one brand of homebrew is to drive thirsty souls to another. Prohibition officials flatter themselves, thinks the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, if they imagine that these rulings are going to put a stop to homebrewing. The bootlegger, adds the Pittsburgh Gazette Times, is in the business for profit, the homebrewer merely to satisfy his personal thirst. The real problem, declares the Detroit Free Press, is to stop the moonshine, blind pig, and smuggling business. The United States will never be any drier than it is today unless that is done. As we are told in the Buffalo commercial, the roads from Pennsylvania and Canada are congested with the running of hard and contraband liquor. Whiskey of a potent and generally vile sort can be had almost everywhere. It is claimed that the dry forces are inadequate to cope with the situation. And now they propose to cover more territory, to go into the homes after that terrible drink, homebrewed beer, which, so far as known, has never done any more harm than the spoiling of the parlor carpet when it foamed over in its too yeasty foaminess. On the same theory that is to be applied to the sale of malt and hops, both of which are products of the field and vine, the government will have to prohibit the sale of sugar with its alcoholic possibilities. Apples, the juice of which can be made into the deadly hard cider and applejack. Raisins, the use of which turns a soft drink into one which inebriates. Corn, out of which may be distilled the deadly hooch of crime and commerce. Why not prohibit the growing of grapes and be done with it? Should the enforcement officials see fit to carry out their intention, they will be doing the wets a real service. They will have usurped functions under the Volstead Act, which we do not believe they possess, namely the interpreting of the law in the way they see fit. By going too far, they will turn many who have become reconciled to prohibition against it. The views of the Buffalo Paper are similar to those of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, which maintains that the Volstead Act is in far more danger from overzealous officials who are bringing it into disrepute than from those who opposed its passage. If ever there was a case in which the public must be coaxed as well as driven, it is in the enforcement of such a law as the Volstead Act, points out the Baltimore News. And the Norfolk, Virginia pilot reminds us that 
There was beer before the 18th Amendment, and there will be long after it. The authorities might as well accept this as inevitable, and make the best of it. In an editorial headed, Brewing Trouble, this paper adds, The American people are patient under affliction and long-suffering. They are generally law-abiding and disposed to heed the voice of authority. But since a large part of the population regards prohibition as an uncalled-for invasion of personal liberty, this docility must be recognized as having limits. The surest way to bring the prohibition law into bad repute is to make it unnecessarily oppressive. But the proposal to inaugurate an extensive and intensive drive against homebrew would indicate that the federal prohibition enforcement authorities are indifferent to this danger. Even if homebrew could be stamped out, it is open to question whether the end would justify the means. This so-called evil is by no means flagrant. In some aspects, home brewing is to be regarded as a safety valve for pent-up antagonism to the prohibition plan. It is not engaged in on an extensive scale. It is more of a pastime than an industry. The home brewer is ordinarily a decent citizen. He is often tempted to try his hand by a desire to prove his knowledge of organic chemistry rather than by a craving for drink. To stamp out home brewing would call for an army of officials and would involve an inquisition into private premises, life, and habits that would be in the highest degree repugnant. A spirit of levity runs through most of the editorials that have come to our attention, although we also find thinly veiled warnings to prohibition enforcement officers to let well enough alone. Many editors also contend that the recent ruling was promulgated for the purpose of securing a decision from the United States Supreme Court. The question will undoubtedly be taken to the courts. In fact, the present ruling against it is doubtless a challenge made for the purpose of inviting litigation and having the matter tested out, suggests the Troy Times. And the Washington Post also believes that the Supreme Court may have occasion to submit some additional observations on the true meaning of the Volstead Act. Perhaps it may be found after a while that the American people can be shoved just so far and no further, notes the Baltimore Sun. And to the man who makes something which he thinks is beer, and the commissioner who quotes a section of the law and then tells what he thinks it means, the New York commercial blithely says, It may be that the commissioner has been actuated by paternalistic motives in a desire to save the home brewers from themselves. It is barely possible, also, that he has been a guest in the home of an amateur brewer, and that one taste was enough. Or it may even be that the commissioner stopped on his way home one evening and bought the makings himself, and had such hard luck that he made up his mind that no other American citizen ought to be subjected to such temptation. His ruling seems to have been based upon good motives, if not upon good sense and good law, for it is not at all likely that the courts will uphold any such drastic invasion of an individual's rights. The police power of the state, and of the United States, can be exerted only for the good of the community at large. If the acts of an individual are not harmful to the community, it is the theory of American government that they should not be interfered with. The commissioner's ruling will, of course, add zest to the manufacture of homebrew, but men cannot be made moral by law. Of the papers which seriously take exception to Commissioner Kramer's new ruling, the New York World, which declares that the despotic spirit in Washington operates precisely as in Moscow, reminds us that nothing in the 18th Amendment applies to hops and malt. Nothing in the Volstead Act forbids traffic in hops and malt, except as it is in furtherance of the illegal manufacture and sale of intoxicants, which must be proved. The ruling of the bureaucrats, therefore, amounts to a new prohibition of articles not named by the Constitution or the law. In Soviet Russia, when new oppressions are contemplated by what is called the government, an order issues from a bureau, and its execution is left to a commissary supported by a file of soldiers. In free America, when attorneys of the Anti-Saloon League squatted at the elbows of the prohibition enforcement bureaucrats want new law conferring more tyrannous power, they make it offhand, and it is duly proclaimed. While the homebrew problem may become the most serious of the many that prohibition enforcement faces, homebrewing must fall under the ban if enforcement is to be a practical success, declares the Springfield Union. Continues this paper, It might not be a success even if the ban were placed but it certainly cannot be a success if it is not. The truth is that the longer experience in the task of enforcement runs, the more apparent it becomes that it cannot be a success unless it is pushed to the limit of the denial of individual liberty, even within the walls of the private house. 
Apparently, there is no road to successful prohibition that does not constantly encroach further and further upon the liberty of the individual, and upon the sale of suspected commodities. Difficulties pile up as the task is pursued. That which was open is driven more and more into secret haunts, and into extremely profitable business, permeating every avenue of the social fabric, and possibly leaving moral deterioration wherever it goes. If it be asked why prohibition may not be liberalized so as to remove the ban of illegitimacy from the milder beverages, whether made in homes or elsewhere, the answer is that there is no such thing as liberalized prohibition. To permit anything is to open the door to everything. Practically as well as logically, there is no such thing as semi-prohibition from a prohibition point of view.